anyone doing at least seven figure, anyone that has seven figures, so definitely do have their own fulfillment setup in China because like the the cost savings, the the processing speed, the, the ability to scale. I mean, not all suppliers can scale like five or six thousand like orders per day. You know, given like, and not necessarily like you're gonna get all the suppliers to be able to have stock. So usually. There's a point of time whereby we buy out the entire China market's supply, so it's like we're scaling so aggressively that like you know everyone's out of stock, and like we have an agreement that only they can sell it to us. So like any any copycats who try to like you know get into the game and try to sell the same product, they don't even have inventory. So eventually they're just gonna like refund all the customers and pay for all like you know take the loss for all the ad spend. So like、um, that's a unique advantage that we do have. Sometimes you know, depending on how hard we scale, and how new the product is, if the product is really mature, super a lot of like sellers and manufacturers, then it's probably harder. But、um, you know, if it's a new product, probably only like five or six、um, big manufacturers we can easily usually buy out there. And welcome to iStack Trainings podcast, the robust marketer. I am super lucky to be here today with Steve Tan. Now, many of you will be familiar with Steve Tan and his brother Evan Tan,、uh, and some of their amazing exploits that they have been putting together in the e-commerce space. My first exposure to Steve was a post that he made on Tim Bird's Facebook Buyers Group, where he showed screenshots of his first four hundred thousand dollar day. Uh, that's a big day by anyone's standards, and、uh, I was just absolutely blown away. I, I, I instantly started digging in and, and researching about who these guys were and what kind of numbers they're doing. So I'm I'm very glad to finally get him on the show. I'm sure, as he's told me, that's just one of his stores. He's got several other ones going on,、uh, and he's here to talk a little bit with our audience about、uh, his e-commerce success. Welcome to the Robust Marketer. How you doing, Steve? Hi Eric, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on like your podcast today. Appreciate it. Yeah, man, excellent. So the first thing that I like to do on my podcast is、uh, the guest tells a little bit about their marketer's hero's journey. So what brought you from starting out? How long have you been doing this? And and sort of what are some of the key steps along the way that brought you to to where you are today? I think、um, I mean mindset is very critical for me. Like, but、uh, I've started back in two thousand six. You know, selling physical products, not on e-commerce stores. But on eBay, so probably that's the, my first step, like in how I got started with selling physical products, and like you know, it scaled to a point whereby I'm doing probably forty, fifty k per month, and I felt that it's really hard to scale further more. So I kind of like started to look for solutions whereby I could,、um, you know, have everything on my own store rather like on a platform whereby I can't control. Like my sales funnels, I can control. I can get all. I can get my email address from all the customers. I can do follow up everything, right? So eventually, we ventured into doing our own、uh, e-commerce stores. So started with a blog, kind of like you know, like the old before WordPress, right? So we dabbled with like HTML pages. Then luckily, eventually, Magento came out. But it's like a really, really heavy solution. Probably back in '07, I we started exploring、um, Magento '07, '08, but things really picked up for us around mid mid of、uh, '08 to '09, whereby we started scaling probably around three to four hundred k per month. At peak was about、uh, the peak was five hundred k. We we can't like you know go through five hundred k. You know anything more than that is like unachievable for us. But it's pretty consistent. The ROI is just crazy back then because like there's literally not much people using Facebook. You know, if you're spending, we're spending about one to two hundred k per month with Facebook back then. So like you're super big baller when you're spending hundred k back then. They'll treat you like king. They'll give you all the API access. They'll give you a lot. But but it's so much easier right now because they're so. There's pixels. Facebook has evolved so much, like made it so easy for all these advertisers, which is why I'm like sharing a lot with all my friends and people who's getting interested in e-commerce because there's no better time to get started because like you guys have Shopify right now, you can get set up like a store in just literally a few minutes. 
or even for a newbie, is like 10, 20 minutes or just like a few hours, right? Facebook ads, you know, probably just takes you like, you know, a few weeks just to really get good at it, you know, familiarize yourself, and it's all about testing. You know, back in the days, we don't even have pixels. You have to use like custom codes, custom third-party tracking, you know, there's no, like, all this convenient stuff ever, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it is, you've obviously come a long way. So you, you first started hitting your big success in 2007, 2008, you were saying? Yeah, and, 2008, and 2009. 2008, yeah. 2009. And then since then, what's it been like? Like what has, what allowed you to get over, did it peak then or has it continued to go up? And then what do you attribute like being able to get over that, that next hump? So it kind of like peaked during then, then we did some different startups, you know, we did some crowdfunding, we did some startups, um, tech startups, consumer electronics, it did pretty well, we did a few million in some of the top startups that we did, you know, things go up and down, met some bad partners, you know, got cheated in a lot of business. So the, at a point of time, it's like, we're still pretty young, you know, young and naive, probably. So you, you're going to meet a lot of people that's going to like peach you because you're successful in a way that they want you to invest your time and money, right? So like it kind of brought us down to, to a point whereby we lost a lot of all the money that we, you know, kind of earned during our young days. So it's pretty much up and down till all the way that I'm kind of like so sick of it. So, you know, just like I even got into Forex just for like, you know, a few months just to see. Uh, you know, because the mind during at the point of time where everything cra- uh, crashes, right, you kind of get into a really bad mindset whereby you want to try to salvage whatever you can, like just to get reach again quickly, right? But, you know, chances that you know that uh, when you get into such a bad mindset and you want to get rich quick, you know, you, you'll just try something that, that's not like, you know, stable, that's really high risk. So I got into Forex for a few months, borrowed 20K, blew it in just a few few weeks. And like I figured out, you know, it's it's not something I really want. Uh, so one of my really good friends just said, why not just go back into e-commerce since you guys are just like good at it, right? So it came, kind of gave me a wake up call. Like after we had like a 24 hour chat, you know, it, it, this guy is really my, my good friend. He gave me a wake up call. So I went crazy and like I just thought like I really need to get up to speed with what's changed and everything. And like for us to just go back and do drop shipping, it's so easy compared to all the startups that I've been doing. It's like a no brainer. Like the amount of effort and energy required to do a startup and compared to a drop shipping or a Shopify store is like probably just one or two percent of what's like doing a startup. So, yeah, I mean, we scaled really, really aggressively, really quickly. Even in the first month, we did, like, high six figures and we continued to do, like, seven figures the next month, and we scaled more. So since then, we did multi- multiple eight figures already since then. Unbelievable. And you're gearing up for your biggest Christmas ever, I would imagine. Yeah, so this year, we're going to make sure we crush hard on Christmas. And, like, we're... So at this point of time, our Philippines team is 100% virtual, but, um, you know, I have a lot of offices in Philippines before, but obviously because of like the startups close and open, right? You have to open your startup, close your startup. I've been through, like, I'm kind of like jaded in a way that I don't really want to have like physical office. And I've spoken to a lot of good friends, like gurus that told me, you know, just keep it, you know, keep it virtual. But I think I came to a point of time that I really want to start a new office again in Philippines like you know I like the vibe the startup vibe you know the kind of like Facebook style Google style kind of office so we're gonna buy it probably buy a big office next next month next year in Philippines and have everyone just like work from the office then kind of like a hybrid you know physical and virtual kind of like um, setup cool we have a team in Manila um, and they're just amazing and they I haven't visited them there yet but I think that I just saw today is a team of 30 uh, that, that iStack has in Manila. And there's this, the, the, apparently the sense of camaraderie uh, in, in the Philippines in, you know, in, in this office is just unbelievable. And people like they've made it a great place to hang out. So people are sleeping there and like, <laughs> like it, it, you know, they're, they play a, like a weekly poker game. Like, the whole, like they have this big poker tournament all the time. And like just the way that, that yeah, that things have kind of come together there. I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think, I think you might see some, some benefits from having that. That being said, the, the remote office thing is, is absolutely wonderful. I split my time about, 
uh, two days a week at home and, and maybe two, and three days in the office. And I really enjoy having that balance. For me personally, it helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds good, man. So like uh, we used to have like a team of 50 people in Philippines, like um, in, also in Manila. So we're in the Otigas area. So it's really nice that like they are such like um, they, they work really closely with their coworkers. You know, it's like in Asia, like, you know, especially probably in China or, or in like Singapore, people don't hang out with colleagues on the weekends. Like, but in Philippines, they kind of like they'll go out for movies, they go out for like bowling. I mean, like the vibe is just like really strong. Like they do like become really good friends. They mm-hmm. do hang out during the weekends with the family, so on and so forth. So the culture is like, uh, it, it's also depending on the company culture, obviously, but um I think these are people that, you know, if you treat them really nice, you know, you get rewarded like 10x your investments. Yeah. In my experience, uh, I'm a pretty nice guy anyway, but uh, their work, <laughs> the, the quality of their work is just astounding, the design, the development. So you're using design, development. Do you also have a lot of like um, customer service uh, reps in the Philippines as well? Yeah, mainly everyone, all the customer support are from the Philippines yeah, because they speak really good English. The rates are reasonable. So I've been telling a lot of my friends, please don't spoil the market rates because like, you know, it used to be like two, three hundred US, but right now probably of the surge of demand for customer support reps, you know, these guys are like just going crazy. Like on Upwork, they're charging like crazy rates, like five, six hundred, seven to eight hundred. So it might seem cheap in the US or in like Europe, right? But like literally everyone is spoiling the market rate because they think it's still cheap, whereby it can be cheaper. But it, I'm not saying that we should underpay all these people, but you know, um, you only sh- you should only reward those that are really exceptional and good and up to par, and not like just across the board, everyone gets the good rate, you know, everyone gets like super high pay. You know, it just spoils the market for a lot of people yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I can imagine. So. So you're now operating at this super high scale. What what are some of the tools? Have you had to build out at the scale that you're out when it comes to fulfillment and customer service? Have you had to build out uh, like your own software tools at all? Or have you been relying on, on external tools? And if so, what are some of the tools that have really made a big difference for you guys that have allowed you to scale to the height you have? I think uh, we do use some tools. It's like local, um, custom made. You know, it's for more for logistics because like you have to integrate with the, you know, your warehouse WMS tools, whereby it takes care of all your logistics, your warehouse management. We do have like an experienced manager in place for that, so he takes care of all the, you know, the setting up, you know, the integration and everything for that. So other than that, you know, we don't use a lot of Shopify apps. Um, mainly because of like you know if sometimes it's used too much it's gonna slow down your store some there's some apps that's not really ethical that steals your data you know but um, overall we just use minimal apps on our stores a lot of things that we do are actually integrated directly into the store so in a way that um, you know we do some uh, custom built apps you know mainly for our logistics but the rest would be you know just uh, I think most of the people are using like custom uh, probably like currency conversion mm-hmm. Wheelio. Um we do some of the we don't we used to but we stopped using um, urgency apps like those countdown timers we stopped using that so yeah we don't we really don't use much of the apps right now so the scale the scaling would majority come from like Facebook ads we diversify a lot of our traffic. Uh, we do a lot of SEO. So SEO accounts to like probably 10, 20 percent. It's incredible. Of our yeah, 10 to 20 percent. Given the, our volume, it's still good money. We do, we do, uh, we don't do native ads for now. But um, after talking with James, you know, probably like we would be interested to test it out too. But um, Google, Google AdWords, GDN, Google Search. Um, you know, SEO, Facebook. Facebook is still the majority because, like, it's so uh, so much easier to scale with Facebook compared to any other traffic source. Yeah, I th- I think it's when they like what you're doing, you you know, you you can really put the pedal to the floor. And yeah, now 
when you, you know you're scaling to these to these incredible heights here are you are you running in like are you running into policy often do you have like a very a strong relationship with the policy team there you obviously have a rep you're obviously treated they were mm-hmm. treating you like a king early on um no <laughs> not now <laughs> no <laughs> it's it's now it's a it's a struggle uh, I mean, like, we do have good relationships with Facebook, obviously, given the span we're doing. So, like, you know, they do advise us on, like, what kind of creatives we should avoid. You know, they obviously can't, like, tell you off the bat for every single creative you upload. But if there's problems, they'll work with us to get it resolved instead of, like, just shutting you down for no reason. If, you're, if your ad got removed, there's a, usually a good reason why, like, uh, what happened. So you're you know what exactly happened instead of being in the dark. Interesting. So so let's just talk logistics a little bit about the kind of scale you're working with. So you're, we, we talk to people that want to get into drop shipping. Most often the easiest thing for them is to go and uh, get Oberlo and get Shopify and just flip things from China. Um, that is that how you is that how you started? Yes, when we just got started, we don't, I mean, when we got started, the unique advantage is being like, we have been in China for like more than 10 years, right? So we have like, um, we're so familiar of where to do all the procurement, all the purchasing. So off the bat, we didn't even use AliExpress because like, um, it's kind of like for for beginners because it's more expensive. So we usually just source from locals, local websites, like, you know, um, um, Taobao or 1688, you know, there's a lot of different sources that we go to, but, uh, you know, being able to speak the local language and being have, having a team there in China does help a lot that sorts out all this. So basically, um, we didn't, like, we can't consider ourselves as dropshipping because, like, we do hold a lot of inventory, multiple, multiple six figures of inventory in our warehouse. Like, I'm not sure if you have seen the video, like, we have, like, a big warehouse in China that does all our logistics. So, yeah, you could check it out. I shot a video, a quick video on yeah, it. Well. So it's like uh, I took, I showed everyone in the group like a tour of my warehouse in China. So basically, it takes care of all our fulfillment and logistics, pick, pack, ship. Everything's done there. So once our procurement team does um, does the purchase, everything gets shipped to the warehouse. So when everything everything is like labeled properly, so every time when they pick, pack, ship. Everything scan, everything goes through the system, so it's very systematic. I don't exactly know like the super needy greed heels uh, of every every single step because like you have to hire professionals to do that for you. I mean, yeah. it's not like the CEO's job to you know know every single shit that happens in the company. But um, definitely, definitely do only consider like having your own warehouse, logistics, everything. When probably doing like at least high, you know, five to six hundred k per month. Then probably consider because anything below that, I don't think it's really necessary at this point of time. So uh, I mean, you can easily get sourcing agents or like you know people or even your sellers could do that for you. Like you know AliExpress sellers, you know if once you have a good relationship with them, they're usually more than happy to source other single products for you because like they get to um, earn money from that. So I have a few good friends doing like you know um, high six figures and they only rely on like their aliexpress sellers which they came to develop a relationship in a way that they could help them become their sourcing agent they could cut out ali aliexpress essentially but the relationship was forged through ali yeah so they are forged through ali you know like kind of like they established kind of like the trust and everything in there then they'll say okay i could help you i could help you source this product so in a way like you know when you started selling more you, you approach him, hey, do you have this product? They will just tell you, okay, I could source this for you because it's so easy for locals just to like, you know, just type it in, get some samples, you know, it's, it's just it's just so easy for locals to, to do it because they speak the, the native language there. So step one, speak Mandarin <laughs> or have a partner that speaks, that speaks it. I think, I think um, you know, just getting started, don't worry too much about it. Yeah. You know, just uh, start off with AliExpress, you know, get everything set up properly, get to know your, your suppliers, get to, like, forge a relationship out of it, and then probably start off to see if they're open to... Usually try not to go for the super big sellers because, like, they are kind of don't give a shit for you because, like, you're, you're small and you're, to them, probably, they don't even know, like, you're going to scale hard enough so but most of them I would say if once you show like numbers once you show the scale 
I would probably say eight out of ten would be more than happy to like take on more business because like why not right it's free money for them like they're just gonna they're just gonna like buy it for you ship it for you they get a cut so yeah yeah but for you guys and your ability to scale just i like newbies aside obviously those are that's great advice for newbies getting in there but you guys having your own warehouse would that was that yeah. a big game changer for you and that way you're able to pull in feeds from all sorts of different products and house them in one spot does that just make it easier to procure things at massive scale yeah, definitely for sure. I I would say it's a unique advantage that we do have. Like you know, anyone doing at least seven figure, anyone that has seven figures, does definitely do have their own fulfillment setup in China because like, the the cost savings, the the processing speed, the, the ability to scale. I mean, not all suppliers can scale like five or six thousand like orders per day. You know, given like, and not necessarily like you're gonna get all the suppliers to be able to have stock so usually there's a point of time whereby we buy out the entire china market's supply so it's like we're scaling so aggressively that like you know everyone's out of stock and like we have an agreement that only they can sell it to us so like any any copycats who try to like you know get into the game and try to sell the same product they don't even have inventory so eventually they're just gonna like refund all the customers and pay for all like you know take the loss for all ad spend so like um that's a unique advantage that we do have sometimes you know depending on how hard we scale and how new the product is if the product is really mature super a lot of like sellers and manufacturers then it's probably harder but um you know if it's a new product probably only like five or six um big manufacturers we can easily usually buy out the entire market for that so when you when you say uh, when you posted about your four hundred thousand dollars spend days and that was on one store essentially yeah now can yeah. you tell me is that one product or is that multiple products within that multiple, store what's your general yeah. approach multiple products it's kind of hard to scale one product to that scale but um, probably we have like a few winners for that and it's actually much easier to scale with several potential big winners but definitely one big winner combined with like probably like four or five small winners. And then you can get to like you know close to four hundred k, or else it's pretty hard. Like with and, hard. and working the up sales, obviously, where you're where you're yes. But and so they're tightly themed products, the products that where you have an audience in mind ahead of time. You probably have been building that audience. You probably have pixel data on that audience. Um, what are the, do you what are what are like? Can you give me one of the ways that you would use in order to scale an audience to the heights that you're talking about? Is it just based on the fact that you've achieved that scale in the past, and therefore your pixel has learned all this amount, or are, are there are there any hacks that you have for ways that that people can can hack to to, to scale that bigger? Is it just a matter of spending? Uh, I would say probably like the product, the product, and your ad copy, your landing page. There's a lot of factors that takes into account on how you could scale to this kind of heights because like. If you're spending a lot of money, obviously you're like anyone can spend a lot of money. But does it convert? Does it get sales? Is this product something that people want? Do you have inventory for this product? Is there like you know um, any potential that you're not able to ship all these products, but you have a lot of sales for that? That's all this. All this has to be taken into account. But I would say definitely being um, considering how aggressive you are. So like let's say because for us whenever there's good profits we'll, we'll just scale it and we use a lot of different uh, you know techniques and strategies on how we scale so it's definitely not just a single strategy that we're using and not just because of the product or not just like um, it doesn't just account to like the strategy or product everything comes into play in all this like skill so I think it took a while for us to get there but definitely you know it's it's hard to get there because like with all the crazy amount of like things you have to do, you have to make sure everything's right before you have to scale because or else you're just wasting ad spend. So I think there was one time that we tried to scale really hard and the product doesn't, I mean, the whole market is just that small, right? But we're trying to force this product to have, have more sales and it doesn't work. So we mm. try to scale it to probably like, almost 100k per day and it just died off from there and so it was wasted wasted spend essentially yeah 
How do you guys deal with with uh, shipping times? I know that's an issue. I know I, I know that Facebook is starting to talk about sending surveys to users after they've ordered products online mm-hmm. and about about when they got their products. How, I guess having your fulfillment center speeds things up a little bit. Is is it a, is it a constant? Is it a concern the the, the length of the shipping time generally? No, uh, we don't even have like concerns about that because like you know we don't have like three to five days processing time, which is already a lot, right? That's almost a week. If you take into account five, let's just say five days, right? Most AliExpress sellers do have like five days processing time. So from the amount of five days processing time, it takes about another two more days to get to the ports and everything. So essentially you're wasting already one week, right? So that is the reason why most of the AliExpress sellers, you know, have like crazy long shipping times because of like they're working through like an AliExpress seller whereby they have tons of orders and your order is just, uh, you know, just one of them being backlogged all the way till like five, six days later. So for us, every order, if we have inventory, everything that comes in on the same day gets shipped out on the same day. Perfect. There's no delays. There's no like uh, processing times. There's, um, you know, if if we have inventory and it's not shipped out, there's someone's going to answer for that and someone's going to get fired for that, you know. So, I mean, having everything in-house for logistics is... I would say it's definitely an advantage and something that you could actually speed up a lot of the things that it's it's not used to be possible. So it's definitely like more cumbersome having like all this space that you need, all this like inventory, all these people that you have to hire. You know, it's like a very manpower intensive like role that when you're setting up your warehouse, it's not like you can set automation for all these virtual stuff. So it's hard, but uh, I would say it's definitely worth it when you're scaling. But uh, anything less than 500k per month, I, I wouldn't even consider setting up all this. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, um, can can you tell me, like, are your is your customer base truly global? Mm-hmm. Is it or is it still mostly based in the United States? Very global. I would say U.S. U.S. is definitely one of the biggest markets for sure. But not hundred percent. So U.S. probably accounts forty percent of all, forty fifty percent. Yeah, that's interesting. It's still the it's still the biggest one country. But you know, everything. If you're if you're missing out on like the other countries like U.K., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all the English speaking countries, like you, you're definitely missing out a lot a lot of the money. And you know, Europe is a very good market for us too. So if you're not doing you uh, Europe market, definitely putting a lot of money on the table. How is the China? Is there is there a Chinese market for the, for these products, or is it really just for the decadent West? I would say definitely yes, but um, very competitive because like you are sourcing from China, <laughs> and, right. right? Right, and like it unless you have a really strong brand because Chinese people like to buy foreign kind of like foreign US made stuff right yeah. so unless you could do white label or you rebrand something that's so like special and you have a really strong brand you can resell it like from US back to China but essentially everything is made in China I've seen a lot of like good brands do- doing that but if you're just doing drop shipping I don't think it's feasible because like the competition is just cutthroat in China man yeah they're undercut you like by crazy like on Taobao, oh man you have to check the prices like it's just ridiculous interesting yeah no that makes that's a very good point maybe we just need to get big like uh, production centers in the heart of the heartlands of the united states where there's like a lot of like they're struggling over there and then they can sell it back to china to be like made by americans made <laughs> yeah made. i mean like definitely there's always a demand for like made in america you know like i guess huh. i mean I, it's just like the culture, you know, like yeah, yeah. Asians, like we, we just like to buy like, you know, US made or European made, like we kind of believe the quality is such so much better than China. So it's, it's just like, I think it's just like the culture thing. Yeah. So, so definitely a good market for that. But um, your branding has to be strong and it has to be like, you know, so powerful in a way that people, oh, they're willing to pay like 10x the price. Yeah. Right. For and sure. that you can't just establish that overnight necessarily. No, um, never. It, it's a it's a pain. It's a real. It's uh, in my in my mastermind like the few weeks ago that the Phuket one that I did. So like a lot of them are trying to transition over to like 
doing a long-term brand, which is good for sure. But um, I shared my experience and all like what I did for my brand because like a lot of people has like a misconception of building a brand. They thought, oh, maybe building a brand is just like creating like a logo, having um, a logo, a slogan, and slapping up like putting it on product. That's branding. That's not true. You know, like when we're talking about branding, it's really it has to be consistent from top to bottom. You know, you have to care about your customers. You have to have a company culture. You have to have a good vision whereby you can sh uh, share with your employees and everything, right? So it's like all the startups that I've done is like kind of like Silicon Valley kind of startups that we are trying to really build something to be really big. So it it's a, a it's a you have to be really prepared when you're going to be invested in doing a brand. So I think I shared a lot of my experience during the mastermind so that like people know what they're getting into rather than just like, oh, it's just a like it's just a logo. It's just a slogan. That's yeah. it. I have a brand. Yeah. Superficial. A lot of people have a superficial yes, idea of, yes, of yes, what a brand yes. takes. Yes. Um, very interesting. So w one of my questions was, I, I, in the last podcast I did with Malin uh, Darris, who is one of the original affiliate media buyers, who's, who's uh, he, he's really good at finding products and making them work essentially. So my question is, what is your approach to sort of fast follow products that are already working in the space that you, that you reveal through niche finding and SEO tools and things like that? Or do you have, have your biggest wins been through pioneering a product and being like a more or less a first mover on some of these big products? Definitely the big, definitely the biggest winners. You have to be the pioneer. I mean, like you definitely can try to be a copycat and like, you know, um, like, you know, that's, I mean, this is like an open, very transparent like market, especially with all the spy tools. But you get to a stage whereby you realize that like even you try, even you know this product is a killer, and like let's say you're selling something that's uh, super, uh, super selling super well, and I'll try to take it and I'll try to replicate your success. Not necessarily, I'll get the same results. It's just strange, but Facebook does like you know I I'm not sure they probably give some preference to like early adopters or like you know people that could start early because like if you have been testing enough products you you just realize that it doesn't work that way mm. like i could take all the best selling products that i know and all the like all the best winners all hot selling products and i'll just slap it on our stop our page you know probably because of a different niche or some of them are general stores you know it, it doesn't just work that i i i honestly hope it could be that easy because like with all the tools that we have all the research team that we have in place we know, we basically know every single hot selling product but it doesn't work that way it's probably because to something to do with your targeting probably a pixel there's a lot of factors but sometimes if you test enough products you just you're just going to get like uh, you know better better odds of winning at this game because it all boils down to testing different kind of products the SOPs, the systems you have in place. So even if we got like I was telling like the Vietnam crowd that I was doing an event last week, even that we got so drunk, we have hangover, the whole team is still running by itself because like you have a good SOPs in place to make sure that all these products are being tested day in and day out without fail. Even without us, me and Evan not being in the business, everything's still running as it is. Yeah, that's that's called a real business, in my opinion. Yeah. Nice, so that you can get away with being hungover. I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and spending an hour talking on a podcast with uh, yeah with a daft Canadian, fantastic. Well, uh, that, that's that's one. And I had another question too about when you're dealing with Facebook at the scale that you're dealing with. When you're spending as much on Facebook. Are you are you using the automation tools that Facebook provides? Are you interfacing, for instance, with their API to spin up campaigns quicker, or is this just is this done through Power Editor and slogging away duplicating campaigns and <laughs> things like that? We use uh, we use a variety of tools to do that. Like I, I, we don't have our own custom built API. I don't think it's required for now. I mean, we're not at scale that we're spending like hundreds of millions per year, so I don't think it's necessary to like custom build your API. Probably it would be better off like using like third party. So they do recommend us to use a lot of like smartly, you know, different kind of like um, a lot of all this like Facebook partners that can help you scale. I think it's not necessary right now for us. And I especially don't like the fact where they have to charge you a percentage of your ad spend. So like I think um, some of them do take like five to 10% of your ad spend, which I don't like it. Yeah. Because like we're spending a lot. So obviously five to 10% is a lot of money for us. I would rather just hire like 
tons more media bias in the Philippines because like I'm I mean good media bias are in Philippines are probably just a few thousand but US per month compared to a percentage of the ad spend I could literally hire like 50 people right so I, I don't see it I don't see like the benefits of doing so but we do use like Facebook automation tools the inbuilt ones with some um, easy kind of like you know uh, automation like increased budget Yep. You know, if CPA, all, I mean, all this are free, so just use it. Of course, don't expect it to be as sophisticated as smartly because, like, it's free. But uh, it's just a matter of time whereby Facebook is going to come up with something that's as powerful as that. Because, like, I've seen Facebook start starting to, like, kind of copy some of the features from all these different tools. Nice. And putting all into, like, Facebook. So... We still use a lot, a lot of Power Editor, and we do use like you know Quaya and Espresso from time to time to mass create ads. But um, yeah, I mean it's like I wouldn't worry too much about using all these super tools, like until like you're at a super big, bigger scale, at least like multiple six, 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 six figures. That makes sense. Now, what about video ads? A lot of people talk about e-commerce and video being the only way to go. What's what's your mix on video to static when it comes to, to advertising for e-commerce? Video is probably, yeah, video is definitely a good one for us. And Facebook reps does highly recommend it. Even if, like, they told us, even if you're trying to do, like, static photo ads, try to, like, just put it into animation so, so that it's video, you know, mm. in, in a way. So, like, definitely, but I do still run a lot of photo ads. I think I still run about... 20, 30 percent of photo ads in our uh, overall campaigns because it still works. I mean, yeah. if the majority of everyone's like, like, I mean, the market's like this, right? When everyone like um, sees someone's doing this thing, everyone flocks to do the same thing. So everyone's leaving the the photo the photo space, right? In a way, so you're gonna be able to kind of like capitalize when all the marketers are not doing photo ads anymore. So probably you could be the big guy in photo ads where everyone's just concentrating, everyone's just pitching, you know, video ads. Definitely video ads is big for us, no doubt big for us, but um, I'll definitely diversify. You yeah. know, usually we try to diversify every, in everything we do, business, ads, traffic, everything we do is diversify it. Nice. And one of the things, another another thing that, that has brought to my attention is like a really key uh, aspect to, to scaling your sales is is, is responding to comments on Facebook ads. Simple things like, you know, when someone has a question, you respond with a product link. You actually, yeah. there's all this stuff that's happening through customer engagement. I, I was going to say, what what kind of, you know, what percentage of your business are is sort of derived from this, like, strong attention to the customer and specifically responding to Facebook ads? Do you see a large portion of sales coming from that? I would definitely, um, I think it's helpful, but definitely not, critical in a sense that's crazy yeah so that um we do have like you know social media managers replying to all these messages day in and day out 24 hours but um it's a good practice i would say but uh, i wouldn't say it's like you know to a scale whereby it affects your business critically in a way but uh, it shows like people that there's someone responding so it gives more engagement, gives people more trust that you're speaking to someone that, that exists instead of like just a viral video. Nice. Super good. I know we're pressed for time today. I think we're just coming close to an end here. But I want to, first of all, say we're super excited that you're going to be coming to Affiliate World Asia uh, in Bangkok on December 6th and 7th. Uh, and we've also just come to an agreement where you're going to come to Facebook Master Live and talk about there. Okay. If for some reason that changes, we'll edit this out. But I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's going to happen. So, so we'll make sure that mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a big hit. And then talk a little bit about what else you're up to. I know you just had this mastermind in Phuket that James Van Elswick mm -hmm. came back uh, with raving reviews about the, the people he met and all these silent killers doing you know just huge, huge numbers in e-commerce. Uh, and he also was talking about how he was like a giant there because he had just seen these <laughs> pictures. He's just such a big dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which was funny. But talk a little bit more about what you have going on, what you have up coming up. I know you, you guys have a really big conference coming up pretty quick. Yeah, so this coming Saturday, we have like, um, I think it's one of the biggest like e-commerce events in the world. So like it's our first event that we set up in Singapore. So part of the reason why Singapore, because I'm from Singapore and I felt that I 
I hate flying, so I don't really like to fly all the way to the U.S., you know, where all the golden nuggets, all the big speakers are there. So, like, this year, probably because of, like, um, I have good relationships with all the speakers, so I kind of like, invited them to Singapore because Singapore is a really nice place, really safe, really clean, like, financial city of, like, Asia. So a lot of, a lot of the few speakers have already been to Singapore, and they love it. So... I was, I was thinking, like, why not, like, bring everyone here, right? Since, like, um, there's such a big pool of marketers in Asia, you know, Bangkok, Singapore, Malaysia. There's so, Philippines, the demand, yeah. yeah, the demand here is just big, uh, if not bigger than the U.S. Definitely, uh, you know, one of the big, big perks is, like, having all these amazing speakers in a, like, a short two days. You know, generates a lot of like, um, you know, people flying all the way from US, all the way from Europe. You know, I mean, South North America. Everyone is just coming. It's like I think we have over like people flying all over like twenty or thirty countries just for this coming Saturday event. So we're super like hyped up. We're so pumped. Um, you know, we really want to see how far we can bring this event to. And your speaker list is incredible. Like you, literally every person that I've come across in this in this e-commerce space is going to be there it's it's just un, it's un, did you get ezra firestone to come out no ezra like he he wanted but uh he doesn't enjoy flying like more than 24 hours which yeah. is like he's from new york so the flight time is just crazy so he he wanted to try to come but you know it's too too far for him so probably next time if we do like e-commerce world summit in like us definitely he's going to be like one of our uh, candidates were gonna I, I like Ezra a lot he's like really down-to-earth guy he you know, very very knowledgeable very willing to share all his stuff so yeah he's definitely one of the first speakers that we reached out to but unfortunately he doesn't enjoy such a long flight so, yeah I found the same yeah. thing I was trying to get him to come to uh, to both Berlin and uh, and Asia and Bangkok and he was he was not into it but uh, yeah, I really enjoy his persona as well. His, he's really down to earth, and and really, he's not just about he 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 talks about all sorts of things on his on his like social profiles and stuff. So he's he's an yeah. enjoyable guy. Definitely, that's, definitely, yeah. That's really cool. Okay, cool. So, um, here's my last question. So we basically, uh, you know, as marketers, we, you know, we're in this pursuit. We're trying to scale our businesses to massive heights. Like, what is it for you that like why do you why do you do this? So is it. You know, everyone likes to win, so th so that's a part of it. But what are the things that that really like that you like that are like what you would consider a peak experience? What's a peak experience for you? Because I feel like we do a lot of this work, and so that we can have these amazing experiences uh, mm -hmm. in life. And and, and for you, because it's funny, because I've seen I've like I've seen some of the some of the awesome pictures. Like you've you've had some peak experiences. I've seen mm -hmm. you know the Gucci bags and the, the the amazing cars and the you know all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But what what really floats your boat these days? Uh, definitely, I think I'm, I, as you said, everyone likes to win, right? And I think for me personally, I really wanted to make back whatever I lost in the past 10 years, like being cheated, being lost lost in business investments. Like I just really want to like, you know, scale this really quickly and as big as possible so that like whatever whatever I've lost through my bad decisions or bad partnerships in the past, can be recovered in like this next few years. I feel like you're gonna do it. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're already there, but uh, it's just that like you know, I'm really aggressive and like uh, ambitious in a way because like kind of like I want to build like a really big company in the past. So it kind of like reduced like I kind of changed my uh, I reduced my ambitions ambitious you know projects. So next year we're gonna focus a little bit more on like softwares. You know, like a little, doing a little bit on the side, some trainings, you know, some of the masterminds that I've did, yep. like meeting more people, joining people's masterminds and like definitely like our main, our main cash cow are definitely e-commerce right now. So definitely looking to diversify this business a little bit more, you know, so that like, you know, just in case if, you know, this business is not as, as good as before, we're not affected, but definitely I still see a huge huge room for growth including ourselves and the overall market because like there's such a huge demand for our physical products you know everyone's buying day in and day out there's more online buyers every single day so i don't see any risk in like 
this business going down anytime soon. No, it's it's the biggest opportunity of our generation. Yeah. I, I feel like right, and it's uh, I've been part of affiliate marketing for over ten years, and uh, I've seen trends come and go, but uh, this one is this one is something else, and this one is. Uh, yeah, it's open to a lot more people than traditional affiliate media buying would have been in yep. the past, just because there, there's a lot more to it. You're able to, 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 yeah, to invest in products, invest in niches, build out your audiences. It's, uh, it's something that's super exciting. I'm super happy to be a part of it as well. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's a good time, definitely, for sure. Nice. Well, that sounds like a good note to end things on. Thank you so much for coming to The Robust Marketer today. I really appreciate it. I really look forward to meeting you in Bangkok. I think we can, uh, I think we can have some fun time, share, share some, some great information. Awesome. Thanks so much for okay. having me today, Eric. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right, bye.